Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Human Services Policy Committee to order. Members, please take your seat. A quorum is present. Before we start, begin our agenda today, I would like to remind the committee of a few housekeeping rules. Everyone in the audience must be seated when they are in the hearing room. Please know sitting or standing in the walkways or in the aisles. This will allow us to keep the accessibility seating available for those who need it. Please leave all signs outside the hearing room. All testifiers who've signed up in advance have been provided time to testify. I reserve the right as chair of the committee to impose a time limit on comments. Time limits are provided so we can keep our meeting on time and hear from as many people as possible. We will usually ask the room if there are any further testifiers in each bill who would like to speak, but that may not always be possible. Thank you for understanding and adhering to these rules. Our first item on the agenda is to approve pr meeting minutes from our Wednesday, March 13th meeting. Uh, Representative Finke, would you like to move the minutes? So moved, Chair. Representative Finke moves the minutes from March 13th, 2024. Any questions or amendments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Our first bill on the agenda today is House File 4528, a Representative Hicks bill. If Representative Hicks would like to come down to the test fire and move your bill. <laughs> Thank you, Chair and committee members. I'll give my testifiers just a minute. Okay. And our interpreter just a second to get seated. I move to re-refer House File 4528 to the General Register. Thank you, Representative Hicks. I also understand that you have an A2 author's amendment. Will you please move and explain your amendment? Yes, thank you. Um, I move to adopt the A2 author's amendment. Um, the purpose of this amendment really is to incorporate feedback from stakeholders and really make sure that we are in the shape that we'd like this bill to be in as we move forward. Thank you, Representative Hicks. Members, any discussion on the A2 author's amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of adopting the A2 author's amendment to House File 4528 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is approved in the House File 4528 as amended. Uh, Representative Hicks, please introduce your bill as amended. Thank you so much, Chair and Committee. Um, this bill is really about the Commission of the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. Um, the commission does great work in Minnesota, and rather than speak for the individuals on the commission, I have brought folks here today who can share more about why it's so important to ensure that the makeup of the commission represents what the commission feels is needed. Okay, very good. Thank you, Representative Hicks. Uh, we will go to your testifiers. We will be trying to limit testimony to two minutes per person. And the first person I have is uh, Alicia Lane. If you would like to introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Lane. I'm the Government, government Relations Director for the Minnesota Commission on the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. And I'm here to speak in support of HF 4528. Our one pager and the letters of support describe the updates needed to more effectively fill our board seat, to effectively fill our board seats with qualified people. Internally, we keep a matrix <clears throat> that we use to try to balance the legislative requirements and the demographics and skill areas of our members. I'm going to show you what this matrix, matrix looks like. So the top row here is identifiers for each board seat. Now the first seven board seats here are at large and those are appointed by the governor. The next eight columns, those seats represent advisory committees. We call those ACs. And those ACs are managed by the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division. 
We do not control those seats. Those are regional seats. So now you'll see the rows. Those are the characteristics of people who, who that are on the board. If they have a certain characteristic, you'll see an X in, that, in their column. So the first section are those that are required by the statute. The rows underneath that are characteristics like race and ethnic, ethnic background, age, gender, experience, and expertise. <coughs> what we want to see is staggered X's. We don't want to see one row entirely filled with X's. Staggered X's represents diversity. So if we take these eight AC seats and reduce those down to five, we have a better chance of seeing that diversity and those staggered X's on our matrix. We do have one more section of characteristics that represents geographic diversity, and we continue to try to keep a balance of ge geographic diversity on our commission. So please support House File 4528 so we can see more staggered X's on our matrix, and we can fill our seats with excellent, motivated candidates to serve on the board. Thank you for your time. You're welcome, and thank you very much for your testimony. Next, I have Michelle Isham. If you'd like, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Isom from St. Augusta. I'm here today to ask for your support of House File 4528. I'm currently a board member on the Minnesota Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I was past chair and vice chair of the commission as well. I'm hard of hearing and a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing. I've been on the board for approximately 12 years and one of my concerns over the years has been the limited number of at-large board members that can be appointed to the board according to the current language. Currently, eight members are appointed from deaf, hard of hearing services, advisory committees, which is another challenge in itself, due to low participation on the advisory committees. The remaining seven are at-large members, which must include parents, a human service representative. In a recent situation that came up, we had a deaf-blind individual ap apply to be on as an at-large board member on the commission. Unfortunately, all of the at-large positions were filled, so we could not recommend the individual to be appointed to the governor. The individual was encouraged to apply to be on an advisory committee in order to be on the commission, but chose not to apply to be on the advisory committee. The advisory committee seat continues to be unfilled at this time. The concern that I have heard is that people do not want to take on more than one service obligation at a time. I've seen this situation happen several times. Your support of House File 4528 would free up more at-large seats to ensure the 50% of deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing representation threshold is met, as well as being more mindful of board diversity. Please support House File 4528 so we can free up more opportunities for outstanding candidates to meet the 50% of deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing representation threshold and increase overall board diversity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Is there anyone else who would like to address the committee on this bill? Not seeing any me. Anyone, I'd like to thank everyone for their testimony. Members, are there any questions or comments? Not seeing any, Representative Hicks, would you like to offer closing comments and renew your motion, please? Thank you so much. Um, my only closing comments is it's always best when we listen to the people involved making decisions. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Hicks moves to re-refer House File 4528 as amended to the General Register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion prevails and House 54528 as amended is re-referred to the General Register. Thank you for everyone for participating on that bill. 
Our next bill that we have today is House File 4552, a Representative Vernick bill. Uh, Representative Vernick, if you'd like to come down to the table, because you are not a member of the committee, I will move to re-refer House File 4552 to Health Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Vernick. Please introduce your bill. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. House File 55 or 4552 is a department bill that I believe my testifier called the DHS Staff Mental Wellness Act. <laughs> this bill basically sunsets or removes from statute a variety of expired reports. And you're here to share more. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, our first testifier is uh, Director Matt Burdick. If you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your testimony, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Matt Burdick, Director of State Government Relations for the Department of Human Services. And really excited to be uh, talking about this bill today. A little bit of history on this effort. This is something that was enacted by the legislature back in the 2021 legislative session. It was actually the then chair of the Health and Human Services Committee and the other body that came to us with the uh, challenge that we've got a lot of legislative reports that are ongoing that may not actually have continued value to either the department or the legislature. We have been in recent years a lot better about providing information the legislature needs via our website, via other uh, vehicles. And there's a lot of time and effort that goes into producing legislative reports at the department. So we wanna make sure that we're focusing our efforts where that time can be better spent. And so what this legislation did is it required the, ironically, the department to create a legislative report detailing um, the legislative reports that would expire under this legislation. And essentially what this legislation did is set an expiration schedule for legislative reports that are ongoing. And the purpose of the report that we do, as we call it, the report on reports, is to give the legislature time to review the reports that would be expiring and continue those that may have continued value to the legislature. So this bill before you simply removes the uh, reports that have already expired in law uh, per the 2023 report. So this is a report that was submitted to the legislature in January of 2023. And we actually submitted a subsequent report in 2024, which will then result in a bill for you next session. And my hope is that as time goes on, we'll have fewer and fewer of these and these reports will get shorter and we won't have to do these bills anymore and we'll be focusing on the reports that you all would like us to be um, spending our time on. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Director Burdick. Are there any test buyers who would like to address the committee? Not seeing any uh, members, any comments or questions? Representative Baker. Ba Backer. <laughs> I've been called worse, okay? I have been called worse, so. Not much, so not much worse as of my partner to the right has said. He said that, Representative Baker. Um, so uh -huh. how, how many reports truly expire? I mean, you're, are we looking at 10? Are we looking at 20? How many reports truly expire? I don't know if that's for you or, or the representative, but that would be. And uh, my second question is, which reports does the department just no longer want to do? Uh, Director Burdick. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative. I believe there's about a dozen reports that have expired per this report. And as I said, the, um, the list is gonna get shorter and shorter as we get into a more regular cadence with this report expiration. So it really depends on sort of the volume of reports that are in queue. I would say overall, um, when we um, worked with the legislature to enact this sort of expiration schedule, we had over 100 reports that we were actively working on for the legislature. And so what the purpose of this report is, is for us to be able to take a look at, do these reports have continued value, and then report that back to the legislature so that folks have some um, idea of what is to, intending to expire. And so that's the purpose of this report that we do on an annual basis. I believe the one that we produced just this past January only had a small handful of reports that would be set to expire next year. So <clears throat> not a huge... Um, volume in terms of the overall reporting that we do. And this does not include one-time reports the legislature asks us to do. This is really about those reports that we do on an annual basis, often kind of retreading the same ground year over year. Representative no follow Backer. Up. Yep, no follow-up. Next, I have Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, Representative, I appreciate you bringing this bill forward. I think these are the kind of things we need to look at to <clears throat> lessen the burden on DHS when it makes sense, and, and any agency that we need to do this. One of the bills, however, uh, and maybe this is to Mr. Burdick, um, is still a report going to the governor on SUD, um, sort of the uh, summary, I think, on SUD service deliveries and recommendations on care coordination. 
if the report is still being re done for the governor, why would you just not send it to the legislature? Because you still have the staff involved, you still have the work involved. Obviously, it's a close uh, issue for me to work on, so I'm just w looking at the reasonableness to go to one branch but not the other branch if the report work is already being put into it. Director Burdick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Baker, that's a great example. In fact, the way that we communicate that is actually in a way that you all see it as well. It's through our annual budget books. So as you'll know, when we do the biennial budget, there's all the change pages that have the information about sort of what's changing. But then we have all the base budget information. That's how we communicate that and satisfy that mandate. We do that in several different areas. And part of the reason that the legislation is written this way is that the expiration only applies, the sort of automatic expiration only applies to reports to the legislature. So we would have to subsequently come back in to modify that statute. But since we're fulfilling that through a different mechanism, it is um, a little bit of a unique situation, but not an intention to not report to the legislature about that important topic, of course. Representative Baker. But to that point then, um, I just wanna make sure, are you, you're still putting the effort into it. Are we really, lightening the load at DHS if you're still having to do the same work in that. I just want to make sure that that testimony is accurately identified. Director Burdick. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Baker, yes, in that we are not duplicating efforts by eliminating the legislative report, which comes in a separate vehicle versus the governor's um, biennial budget book. That's a practice that all agencies go through just thank generally. You. Thank you. Okay, very good. Any other t comments, questions? Not seeing any. Uh, uh, Representative Burnick, I invite you to make any closing comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for a very swift hearing. I appreciate it. Thank you, <clears throat> Representative Burnick. I will renew my motion to re-refer House File 4552 to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion is approved and House File 4552 is re-referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. Our next bill on the agenda is House File 4075, another Vernig bill. Uh, since uh, Representative Vernig is not on the uh, committee, I move to re-refer House File 4075 to the Human Services Finance Committee. Representative Vernig, if you'd like to please introduce your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Before you is House File 4075, a bill brought forth by LifeWorks, a Minnesota nonprofit partnering with people with disabilities to drive change by increasing opportunity and access to the community. This bill appropriates $3 million, one-time dollars in fiscal year 2025 for a statewide disability inclusion pilot project. I'll be honest, I was a little skeptical at first when they came, I had a lot of questions for them and they answered them and they answered them really well, so I appreciate that. People with disabilities represent the largest minority group in Minnesota and remain the only minority group that anyone can join at any point in their lives. Nearly 12% of Minnesotans have a disability and 22% of those citizens have intersectional identities and 42% are 65 or older. That further compounds the common barriers to access and opportunity. Barriers including language, transportation, economic stability, cultural and racial bias, and social isolation have prevented full participation in community and resulted in people with disabilities with intersectional ID identities being left behind. People with disabilities have been terminated from their jobs due to the lack of accommodations, but far too frequently they leave before being fired for fear of dis disclosing a disability, not understanding their rights, or just being too exhausted to navigate the systems and barriers in place. I have seen this firsthand, the challenges that people face, and I have actually helped them navigate that process for accommodations, from needing accessible parking to grab bars in the toilet room, to modifying programs like library services to deliver books to patrons who can't access the library. This three-year statewide disability inclusion initiative aims to increase awareness and break down some of the barriers people with disabilities face by training and educating people with disabilities to increase their knowledge of available resources, bringing disability inclusion training to parents, guardians, and families with disabilities so they understand the disability service system, providing education to current and prospective employers of people with disabilities because workplaces that fully include people with disabilities see two times more economic profit and higher productivity than businesses that don't engage in the disability inclusion, building capacity for culturally specific services and support led by rural, immigrant, and BIPOC entrepreneurs and business owners, honoring people with disabilities and older adults with intersectional identities launching a statewide disability inclusive assessment and associated technology solution 
for businesses and other community spaces. So citizens with disabilities know that they will be welcomed. Physical spaces may be accessible and interactions free from discrimination. LifeWorks will use funds to build out their disability inclusion division, including coaches and trainers to contact, to connect with thousands of people with disabilities, families, businesses, and community organizations statewide. They will invest in community outreach staff who are culturally affirming to begin conversations around disability and start people on a path towards services and resources. Additionally, they will develop an innovative web-based or mobile tool that allows people with disabilities to choose disability-friendly businesses in their communities, from coffee shops to concert venues to rideshare services to doctor's offices. This assessment tool will go beyond the current ADA standards and include aspects of disability that are not um, currently considered. And they've been doing this work, and in three months, they've trained over 300 people. In your packet, you'll find letters of support, and I do have testifier. Thank you, Representative Bernick. Uh, I will go to our first testifier, uh, Kevin Kimmitz. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Fisher and members of the committee, and thank you, Representative Vernig. Uh, you're spot on with the last name, Kmetz. So, my name is Kevin Kmetz, and I'm the Vice President of Programs for the North Region of Minnesota and LifeWorks. Uh, we are a nonprofit partnering with people with disabilities since 1965, so we've been in the community for almost, almost 60 years. In addition, we do provide services in 60, counties, 60 of the 87 counties across Minnesota. Personally, I've spent the last 15 years of my career working in the disability services field. As Representative Vernig laid out, there is a critical lack of access and inclusion for people with disabilities across our state. And the solutions that we propose in House File 4075 will put us on track toward inclusion for all of our citizens. People with disabilities want to, and they should be able to access our communities. However, as it's been demonstrated, not all community spaces and places are ready for people with disabilities. Um, a couple of quick examples, at LifeWorks, our clients have been turned away from community centers, frankly asked to leave, questioned when they're at coffee shops due to the size of the groups that they're in, and asked to leave public parks. People with disabilities we, that we support have been terminated from their jobs due to lack of accommodations, and we also have a couple examples of people that we support being openly mocked by their coworkers because of their disability and their speech. So, these real life examples have, have a common thread that individuals, communities, and businesses are not educated on disability inclusion. So as it's laid out, we do, we do have the, uh, a two-pronged solution. Um, first, expanding the, the already established LifeWorks disability inclusion training model to businesses, community groups, and individuals statewide. Um, as Representative Vernig shared, this is something that we have already, already started, and we would like to continue and scale so that we can pro provide it across Minnesota. Um, after just one training, attendees of our, of our training report an average of 54% growth in their comfort level in supporting colleagues or neighbors with disabilities, and a 31% increase in their knowledge of disability inclusion. And in one small example, one business began hiring people with disabilities as, two, as soon as two weeks after their education session. So these results are certainly promising, but to achieve a fully inclusive Minnesota, we need Minnesota to invest in these efforts. Uh, with Thank investment, oh, sorry. If you could uh, wrap it up. We're doing two minutes for test fires. Sure thing. With investment and partnership from the legislature, we believe that we'll see more people with disabilities access services and find jobs for which they qualify, helping Minnesota lean into their employment first initiative and decrease the bias and stigma that creates barriers across all of our communities. Thank you, committee and Chair Fisher. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, I have uh, Mamadi Kona, and I apologize if I didn't get the pronunciation right. Thank you for being here today. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, member of uh, the community. Uh, my name is Mamadi Kone. I'm a cybersecurity professional and the founder of uh, an organization called We Network Now. It's an, organi an organization that provides professional development and mentorship to folks of a diverse background. And uh, our organization stands committed to providing inclusivity and opportunity for all. Since the inception of our organization, our programs have positively impacted hundreds of individuals, ranging from high school students, college students, <coughs> to seasoned professionals. 
To that end, please allow me to share a passage from, the, from our Constitution. We hold this truth to be self-evidence that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain honorable right, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, this test does not apply to everyone, particularly individuals of, with disabilities. Growing up uh, in Guinea Conakry, which is a country in West Africa, I witnessed firsthand how people with disabilities are often marginalized and treated as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. To my surprise, I have observed similar behavior towards people with disabilities in Minnesota. That's why our organization has partnered with LifeWorks to raise awareness and educate individuals about disabilities. As you may have here already, nearly 12% of Minnesotans have a disability, representing a significant portion of our population. Just imagine the positive impact if our system worked inclusively for everyone. It would have been a win-win situation. Our schools would be better, our communities would be better, our workplaces would be better, and most importantly, our economy would be better. Together with LifeWorks, we are striving to raise awareness and advocacy for inclusivity, but we cannot do it alone. That's why I'm here today to give my testimony so we can all work together to create a more inclusive society, not only for individuals with disability, but for all the underserved communities. Because ultimately, we are all better off when the least privileged among us are supported and empowered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there, is there anyone else that would like to address the committee? Uh, Mr. Mark Hughes, if you'd like to come forward, please. There should be a button on there you may have to turn on. Give it a test. I know I got two minutes before the buzzer goes off, but I just wanted to say there was a gentleman by the name of George Moodry who used to be president of Life Works. At that time, Minnesota Blue Cross Blue Shield, who was the largest nonprofit in Minnesota, brought over a lot of the workers from Life Works, and they had job coaches and such. Bottom worked in the mailroom, janitorial, and had different jobs like that. And uh, I was involved because we had fundraisers for Life Works. Um, usually in the summertime, a lot warmer. But uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield put on a big uh, spread. I don't know that they do now, but they're always included there in their annual meeting. And I, for one, if you don't know, I'm, I'm pretty big on employment for the disabled. It's important socially. It's important mentally. Uh, we want to be included in, in, the, in, the, in the workforce. We might have a different way of doing it, but we'll get it done. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, not see any. We will go to member questions and comments. Uh, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, um, this is a this is a an interesting concept. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think this is a good bill. Uh, maybe to the testifier, because uh, I know that Representative Burning wasn't here last year. Because so this is going back a little bit. Did you propose this idea last year when the state actually had a lot of money? And now that we don't, I'm kind of curious as the timing is going to be a ch the biggest challenge here is because I actually support what we're trying to do here, but we don't have that. So were you around last year? Was this not heard last year, sir? Thank you, Representative uh, Mr. Baker. Oh, my apologies. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Baker. Um, we did not introduce this bill last year. Um, we've, we've been working to introduce this concept um, and, 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 and provide our initial tests prior to that. Um, we are the grateful recipients of grant dollars from DHS that have allowed us to do our few initial trainings and, and um, partner with an adult learning specialist who identifies as having disabilities to, to build out our content. Um, and we've, at this point, reached, reached the point where we, we believe that we can, we can scale and grow. So longer, longer answer than maybe you're looking for. Representative Baker. Um, and just to follow up, I think, again, I, I sit in the Workforce Committee, too. This could actually find itself through that, that part, too. I've, very concerning when you've got um, employers or coworkers that are not accepting and understanding of our coworkers that are struggling with disabilities. And there's a lot of education there. But again, I like the concept. It's just it'll be a challenge this year to find the dollars. But I appreciate this, you know, this idea coming to us. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Representative Baker. Next, I have Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and just like Representative Baker, I like this program because we need to um, focus on the, these these good folks. If you if you do not get the three million dollars from the state, mm -hmm. are there other avenues? You mentioned grants or something like that. Um, just just wondering because it's, it's such a good program. I I wouldn't want it to die just because of the the budget that we have and and, and so forth that we uh, may not. Mr. Kemets, go. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Fisher and Representative Backer. Um, we are committed to continuing this program. Um, we are certainly hopeful that it that it will be funded, but we we will exhaust all avenues that we can. So that includes um, searching for grants, whether via via DHS or DEED or other other private organizations. Um, the 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 amount funded would truly allow us to scale and, and bring it across Minnesota. But we're committed to continuing the work regardless. Representative Backer. Okay. No, no follow up. Thank you. All right. Very good. It. Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Fisher and um, <clears throat> Representative Vernon for your bill and to your testifiers. Um, I mean, it's been said a couple of times now, but I would like to echo how appreciative I am of this. And I think it's really important that we listen to um, trusted nonprofit organizations who know how to go into specific communities and do the work that those communities need. Uh, I think it builds trust when we go to those spaces where um, frankly, most of our dollars and most of our communities are not interested in investing, right? We, we need to build our workforce like we heard. We need to build um, relationships and trust. And um, I have a bill in workforce that's not that different than this. And I, I'm really excited to see this model moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative Pinky. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, Representative Vernig, would you like to make closing comments? Uh, yes, thank you for your consideration of House File 4075. I understand, yes, we do have limited funding, um, but it's always good to identify the need. So, you know, you may see me back here again with the same <laughs> ask next year. With this ambitious work, Minnesota will see more people with disabilities and older adults accessing the services for which they qualify and decrease the bias and stigma that creates barriers across our communities. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Representative Bernig. I renew my motion that House File 4075 be re-referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. Motion is approved and House File 4075 is re-referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. Uh, next, we have on the agenda House File 4563, which is a Representative Bank Committee. If you'd like to come down, please. Uh, because Representative Bang is not a member of our committee, I move to lay over House File 4563. Chair Bang, welcome to the committee, and please introduce your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this bill continues to build on our work to address the mental health workforce shortage. Uh, Section 1 creates a mental health and substance use disorder education center within the Department of Human Services. So there's an entity truly focused on our workforce. The center can analyze data, engage high school students, and if identify barriers to licensure, help people understand the different uh, MH and SUD professions and more. Uh, we base it on the model in Nebraska, whose legislature passed it in 2017 and so in those 10 years uh, they saw the number of providers increase by 39 percent. Uh, section 2 adds that the program pays for supervision for people working towards uh, licensing in, uh, rural, in targeted rural areas of the state uh, and to also uh, organizations serving underserved populations. Section 3 establishes a training program for people working with youth with a mental illness. Uh, there are not enough services for our children and youth and especially not enough residential treatment beds. Hiring and retaining staff is the most critical element needed to rebuild capacity and uh, help children and families with the highest needs. Training for new staff is incredibly important as we want to teach, equip, support, and prepare new staff to deliver quality, clear care to our uh, vulnerable children with high levels of mental health symptoms. Uh, this section will increase statewide access to training cohorts and in doing so accelerate overall access to children's mental health treatment. Uh, this model is based <laughs> off existing training provided by the Center for Advanced Training and Child Welfare at the University of Minnesota. 
Uh, section four uh, closes the gaps for people who have graduated with their master's degree to be a mental health professional, have finished their practicum, and haven't taken or received the results of the national test. So this gap, uh, this specific gap prevented providers from being able to bill for the treatment they provided. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I also have Sue from NAMI who can also add further to my testimony. Thank you, Chair Bang. Uh, Sue Abderholden, welcome to the committee. Thanks for being here. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. And I really want to thank Representative Bang for her continued advocacy in addressing our workforce crisis. And it is a huge crisis. Um, we know that people are waiting months um, to be able to access therapy appointments, psychiatry appointments. Um, we know that sometimes we have to take beds offline in children's residential facilities, adult urge facilities, and even hospitals because there isn't the staffing. Um, we, you did do a lot of good things last year um, that really kind of helped, and so this just kind of adds to it. Um, I think the Workforce Center um, would be really helpful because then we're really focused on it, right? We're measuring kind of progress that we're making, uh, making sure that high school students know that this is a viable and interesting and rewarding career. Um, we know that paying for supervision has been um, a great um, addition. Um, paying for supervision on top of your student loans and everything like that was really prohibitive for many people and about half of the people never went on to get their license because they couldn't pay for supervision. But we also wanted to make it clear in the statute that it includes rural areas as well. Um, Aspire has really worked hard um, to focus on the youth training um, institute and I think it's another great idea to kind of professionalize that work and get more folks in. And then the last one is really, again, a policy issue with no fiscal note, but you know, if you were in the midst of your practicum and, and supervision, then you could bill. But as soon as you finished those hours and were waiting to take the test or waiting for the results, then you couldn't. And so that's just kind of an odd gap that we just really need to close. And again, there's no fiscal note to that. So I would just um, urge your support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Abderholden. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on the bill? Not seeing any members, any questions or comments? Uh, I see Representative Baker first and then Representative Engen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Ang, for this. Uh, I, again, I, I, I really do like this idea. This is a great concept to get more young people into the, into the thinking of how can we help more people in this uh, area. And this may not be a question you can answer because, again, there's no fiscal note yet. If there was a fiscal note, or what, what does the Department of Health think this is going to look like if it, if it is something that we establish? Is it uh, full-time equivalents? I guess I'm just trying to think, how big is this scope going to be? Is it five full-time employees? Is it ten full-time employees to build this up? What would be that, that sort of that idea of what the MDH is going to be thinking about what this will take to get it stood up? Uh, Riffman Bank. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for your question. Uh, there's no fiscal note uh, attached to it yet, um, and so I can't give you an exact number, but I'm definitely open to seeing what that could look like um, and hearing feedback from the department as well. And, and I, Mr. Chair, and I only offer up only because I, I didn't expect you to maybe have that yet, but it's a really good concept. I think it's an idea that uh, we can work towards. I'd be happy to work with you on this again. That, that community uh, of mental health, especially with SUD, is so underfunded right now. We need to do more to get, I think, our foundation built up with some real good re, you know, rate reimbursements to get them competitive. This is always, these are always good ideas, but we've got to start with our foundation. We've got to start where we really need it today to save people today. This is very, uh, very good long-term stuff. So I appreciate you bringing the bill forward, and I, I look forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, Representative Ingus, Engen is, nope, okay, very good. Uh, next, Representative Edelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Representative. I just want to, I mean, the, the the last part of this bill, while it seems small, uh, lines 4.16 to 4.19, it's a huge gap, and I just want to thank you uh, in terms of the licensure and just the gap that happens in the clinical world. So thank you for addressing this, and thank you to Ms. Aberholden for that. That's, that's a good catch. Okay. Thank you, Representative Edelson. Any other further comments or questions? Not seeing any. Uh, Chair Bing, any closing comments you would like to make? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank you and the committee for their time and your support. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Bing. With that, I renew my motion to lay House File 4563 over for possible inclusion. Thank you.
Next, we have House File 4360. Chair Noor, please come on down. Uh, if you'd like to please uh, introduce your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to refer House File 4360 to Human Services Finance Committee. Thank you, Chair Noor. If you'd like to start your, begin your presentation, please. Mr. Chair and members, I'm sure you've heard about uh, case management. And as you're aware of many of the counties, uh, they do contracted case management. We have seen the case load for case management to grow in the state. And quite, quite frankly, there are so many counties who do in-house, but there are some counties who use external partners to do the case management. However, it's uh, a little bit disturbing that uh, some of the counties, they have not been able to work with external partners in terms of contracts and everything else. So this bill uh, technically removes uh, an expired date and opposite language in the bill, but it also requires counties to initiate a competitive uh, contractual uh, proposal every two years so that they can provide adequate services and to make sure that they can also provide culture specific programs within the case management. So this is a simple request and uh, I would like to ask for your support. Uh, my testifier could not make it today and uh, she sent a letter I'll be including uh, for your future reference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair Noor. Is there anyone who'd like to testify to the committee on this bill? Not seeing any members. Any questions or comments for Chair Noor? Oh, I see the hands go up. I'll start with Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I know we don't have a testifier, but the stakeholders involved with it, what feedback have you received, dear Chair Noor, in regards with the, the stakeholders involved, especially, of course, the counties? Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you ask me where we, should we go with case management, I believe that the counties should take the main responsibility in providing that case management. Unfortunately, because of workforce shortage and so many other things, we're shifting the responsibility to external entities who are now burdened with doing the same work. You understand the complexity of human services. Imagine sending it to somebody else to do the same work for less. So I think we, sh we need to examine that whole process. To me, it's time to look into how case management is done and to make sure that uh, the counties have got the best um, you know, support that they can get to ensure that the services provided by case management because of the complexity of human services meets the needs of Minnesotans. Representative Backer. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and the concern that I have is, is and uh, I know we deliver our services through the county, yes, I get it. At the same time, um, we, counties are already strapped, especially your smaller counties like um, I represent Travers, Wilkin, Grant, and so forth. So we can take this and move it over to them, but without the resources, um, I don't remember we heard a bill last week, I believe it was in this committee. Um, yes, it was. It was um, um, Representative Hansen in which we had, we passed the bill, but nothing has been done because we don't have the resources. And I'm really concerned that the smaller counties um, won't be able to do it. They don't have the resources. That's uh, my concern uh, on this. So um, that's all I have there, my comment on that. Thank you, Representative Backer. Are there any other comments or questions that people have? Uh, Representative Fix. Thank you so much, Chair. Chair Noor, I just have a quick question. So does this require that counties contract or does it just change the requirements if they choose to? Chair Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hicks, this changes if the counties want to do external contracted case management. But basically, most of the smaller counties, they do in-house, so they don't do contracted case management. So this is actually helpful. This is about transparency, accountability, and fairness if they're going to require external entities to do the case management. So this is um, a win-win for them because it's also more about fairness, transparency, but also being more inclusive in how the work is done. Representative Hicks. 
Thank you so much, Chair. I just wanted to clarify that because I got a little confused. So thank you. Okay, very good. Not seeing any other questions or comments. Uh, Chair Noor, I invite you to make closing comments and to renew your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will renew my motion that House File 4360 to be re referred to Human Services Finance. Chair Noor moves to re refer House File 4360 to the Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion is approved and House File 4360 is re referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. Our final bill is a bill that I will be doing, so I will be turning the gavel over to Vice Chair Frederick. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Would you like to move your bill? Yes, thank you, uh, <coughs> Vice Chair Frederick. I would like to move House File 4392 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, thanks, Chair Fisher. Uh, I believe that there's also an A1 author's amendment. Can you please move and explain your amendment? Yes, I would like to move the author's A1 amendment. Uh, this does several things. It clarifies some of the SUD provisions and add provisions related to the community's first services and support that align with rich, the recently approved state plan agreements with CMS. <coughs> Any discussion to the amendment? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor. Uh, Representative Hicks. I just want to say yay, CFSS. <laughs> Is that cheer, all, right. a cheerleader? Uh, all those in favor of adopting the A1, A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. <clears throat> the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Chair Fisher, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Frederick and committee for the opportunity to present uh, House File 4392 as amended. Uh, this bill is a bill from the department. Uh, it does a variety of different things. First of all, it uh, addresses the disability form simplification, uh, addresses remote reassessments for community first services and supports, uh, addresses technology first policy updates, uh, addresses the minimum wage for people with disabilities, something that we started uh, last year. This is, continues that process. Updates to the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Act and addresses substance use disorder corrections and policy improvements. I know that the uh, DHS has been working with community partners on this, and for a complete uh, walkthrough of the bill, I'd like to turn it over to Christy Grom from the department. Uh, thank you, Chair Fisher. Ms. Grom, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. I want to extend my thanks to Representative Fisher, Chair Fisher, for carrying this bill. Um, it's, it's an important one for us, certainly. And I'll just go ahead and do a quick overview of, of the bill section by section. I know there are testifiers here as well that um, would like some time to share their thoughts with the committee. So sections 2 and 21 of this bill are related to disability services forms. Um, so we have a couple of forms. Um, um, for the disability waiver rate system, as well as for service terminations that providers and counties need to fill out. Um, so the DWRS forms are related to um, the documentation that providers need to input from a person's support plan in order for the county to calculate a rate. Um, and then the, the service termination forms are really just to identify to the department why an individual might be getting a service termination. Um, and those are really important forms, but we've got some counties that are using variations of forms and providers that are doing the same. Um, and we just want to streamline those and make sure that everyone's using the same form, that we're connecting with counties, we're connecting with providers and letting them know and, and reaching out to them and understanding what they need on that form. So there's just one standard form, hopefully making it simpler for everyone. Um, section 18 relates to the personal care assistance and community first services and supports program. Um, so a few sessions ago, um, I believe it was two sessions ago, um, people who are on getting disability services through the disability waivers and the elderly waiver uh, waivers are able to get their remote, their, able to get their reassessments, their min choices reassessments remotely. Um, and so this provision really just aligns the um, that requirement with CFSS and PCA so that um, if you're on a waiver, you can already do this. And now under this provision, you would be able to do the same under CFSS. Um, and there are guardrails around this provision to make sure that a person has informed choice, that they can choose an in-person assessment at any time, of course, as well. So this is really inefficiency that we learned as part of the, the pandemic experience. 
Um, section 19 is just a technical policy update, and so it relates to the technology first um, policy statements in law, which were passed in 2020. Um, and right now in those statements, there are various categories. There's an independent living first, there's employment first, there's technology first of these statements that indicate that these are priorities for the state. Um, and in each of those, most, most of those provisions, there's a statement that says an individual will be provided um, independent living options before other options, for example. And that particular provision or that language isn't included in the technology first section. And so we're just adding that language that making sure that it's not just a default, you have to get um, you know, standard in-person services, but making sure that we can really emphasize that that's not the default, that people have other options and that they're offered those technology or remote services as well. Sections 22 to 37 are related to the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Act. So this is um, a really important act. It hasn't been updated in about a decade or so, and so there's some modernization that we really need to do. We've been working with community on this. We've got some feedback from them. We've integrated their support. Um, but the high-level changes that you'll see, the most substantive changes are changing the, the name of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services Division at DHS to include the term deaf blind, um, which is just something that we need to do to be inclusive of the entire community, um, as well as um, making some changes around requiring services that are linguistically affirmative in addition to culturally affirmative. And there are some technical clarifying updates in there as well. Um, sections 3 through 9 and 1117 are related to substance use disorder primarily. Most of these are cleanup and corrections. We made a lot of um, really important advance advancements last session um, in substance use disorder. And because there was language moving in all different bills and lots of things going on there, there were some corrections that we had to make, some things that we missed, some cross-references that need to be updated. There was a rate that was inadvertently deleted in one of the versions. So we're really making most of those um, cleanup changes. There are a couple of more substantive changes. I'll mention um, a couple of those. So one is um, making an allowance for a medically monitored intensive inpatient program um, that um, currently there's one of these providers in the state. They're at a 3.7 ASAM level. And um, right now we don't have the 3.7 level in our ASAM criteria in our um, implementation plan with, um, with CMS. Um, that is something we are working on including, but right now we want to make sure that they don't have to enroll as a provider that's different than what they actually are. So we are offering this provider some flexibility to meet the um, January 1 of 2024 um, deadline for residential providers to enroll. Um, and then also there are some changes around providers and when they provide information around opioid education to um, individuals that wor they're working with. And then lastly, I will touch briefly on sections 1, 10, 20, and 38. These sections are related to minimum wages, um, minimum wage protections for people with disabilities. Um, so really, this is just a concept that this committee is familiar with. You've heard it last year in various hearings. Um, but this is requiring that people with disabilities are paid at least the minimum wage by 2028. So it's not taking away anything from anyone. It's just making sure that um, if programs want to tra transition to competitive employment, they can do that. If they don't want to transition their business model, they don't have to. So all of the same programs are still going to be available for people. Um, it's just that they will make the minimum wage by 2028. So this is something, um, I know there's a lot of folks here to talk about this issue, but we have come a long way since 1938 when the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed. Since then, um, the disability movement has you know, been pretty rapid paced. So we've had the ADA, we've had Olmstead, we've had um, the Home and Community-Based Services Settings Rule, which led to day services reform. We created new day services so that people who weren't working were able to get day support so that there were limits on pre-vocational um, pre-vocational services. We've had since then employment first policies, the E1 Minnesota partnership. Um, and then last session, uh, this legislature passed a whole host of really reform, reformative um, changes that will um, advance competitive employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, the one thing that wasn't passed last year was this provision to actually um, phase out the use of subminimum wage. So um, at the department, we are really excited to continue to work with the legislature on this work with, we know Representative Hansen has been a great advocate. Chair Fisher has been a great advocate. Um, and we also understand that families have some concerns. We want to be sensitive to those. We want to listen to them. We want to um, support them through this transition. Um, and um, I'll, I think, maybe end it there and just say that uh, the disability advocacy movement doesn't happen in a vacuum. So we've got a lot of folks here who um, can say and explain much better than I why this is such a critical, um, critical uh, provision that we passed this session.
Uh, thank you, Director Graham, for the walkthrough. And to that point, of uh, we have a healthy list of people that have signed up to testify today. Uh, additionally, there's been testimony that's been submitted that, that we received after deadline. Uh, so it is not included in members' packets, but it will be emailed out after committee. Uh, so first up for testifiers, we will start with Danielle uh, Mahaney. And on deck is Heidi Mahan. When you get situated, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify to ensure that people with disabilities are paid at least the minimum wage or higher in the state of Minnesota, where wage justice is a strongly held value and included in, in our employment first policy. My name is Danielle Mahaney, and I work at the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration on a project called the Minnesota Transformation Initiative, or MTI. Over the past two years, MTI has supported eight providers across the state in their work to end subminimum wages. All eight providers have created a robust transition plan. No one has lost services because of their provider's transformation. Rather, individuals are receiving employment and day support services that some didn't have access to before. All providers have developed plans for sustainable business models that do not rely on some minimum wages, and none have expressed concern about their ability to stay open. There is not a one-size-fits-all plan to this work. The technical assistance MTI provides looks different for every provider. We visit the organization, meet with their leadership and other stakeholders. We learn about their service model, and then work together to build their individualized transition plan. MTI also provides extensive, impactful trainings on a range of topics related to expanding community employment and organizational transformation. We support peer mentorship opportunities by connecting providers that are in the process of ending payment of subminimum wages with those who are further along in their transition. You may hear there isn't a plan to support providers, but this is exactly what we are doing with the money appropriated by the legislature last session. The Minnesota State Legislature has made funding available for the foreseeable future to continue the work to help service providers with this powerful, equitable transformation. ICI strongly supports the plan to ensure wage justice in Minnesota and pay all people with disabilities the minimum wage or higher. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Heidi Mann, and on deck is Edward, Dupree Edwards. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is Heidi Mahan. I'm the Executive Director at Epic Enterprise, Inc. in Dundas, Minnesota. I speak to you as a provider who currently pays individual subminimum wages under the 14C certificate. Epic supports House File 4392, specifically the provision purporting in issuance of 14C certificates, which authorize the payment of subminimum wages to people with disabilities. Epic currently has individuals working in the community at competitive wages in customized positions, as well as individuals earning subminimum wages. At Epic, we envision a community that values and embraces every individual while investing in individuals with disabilities as they pursue opportunities in the broader community. To this end, we support moving to minimum wages for work and discontinuing the use of 14C subminimum wage certificate. We will be ending the use of our 14C certificate during this year. The state legislator just last year funded historic investments in individualized integrated employment so that all people with disabilities who want to work and can earn minimum wages in job that, jobs that match their skills and interests, for those that do not wish to work or only work part of the day, our life enrichment services provide meaningful and integrated programming to support them if they choose. I've had many clients who are earning subminimum wages ask me for an increase as they would like to earn more money. They want to participate in the ordinary things we take for granted, going out to eat, buying a specific brand of shoe or outfit, going on vacation, going to a Vikings United Twins or Wild Game, going to a concert or a theater. Subminimum wages perpetuate the discrimination and inequality that people with disabilities face in the workforce. Paying individuals with disabilities less than minimum wage is not only unjust, but also undermines their dignity and value as human beings. It reinforces harmful stereotypes and perpetuates a cycle of dependency and poverty. Minnesota has selected a minimum wage that is higher than the federal wage, so why would we offer a subminimum wage? Minnesota can do better. 
It is essential to recognize the abilities and contributions of people with disabilities in our society. Individuals with disabilities are capable of performing meaningful work and should be given the opportunity to do so at a fair wage. Ending subminimum wages will promote inclusivity and equality in the workplace, fostering a more diverse and vibrant workforce in Minnesota. Furthermore, ending subminimum wages aligns with the values of fairness and equality that are fundamental to our society. It sends a powerful message that all individuals, regardless of their abilities, are valued members of our community who deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. I urge you and the members of the committee, along with the governor, to take action to end subminimum wages for people with disabilities in our state. Let us work together to create a more inclusive and equitable society for all. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Up next is Dupree Edwards, and on deck is Matthew Bergeron. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, thank you, committee. My name is Dupree Edwards. Uh, I'm here to testify about um, that, you know, uh, people that didn't reserve, re didn't have 14C. So I'm just here to tell my testimony about how I've been in competitive appointment since 2011. All right, my name is Dupree Edwards. I'm testifying to eliminate subminimum wage. I live in Fridley, Minnesota. I have some mental health and cognitive disabilities. I grew up in the Twin Cities and moved to Arizona for a few years, and but have lived in Minnesota since 1999. I live in a licensed housing, receiving the DDD waiver. Uh, it took a lot of work to avoid being trapped in subminimum wage jobs because that is what I was offered after graduating from Transition Plus program. However, I knew right away that I was capable of competitive and employment. I knew that I might not ever have other opportunities if I took casework or job at DTH, that was the name of what we use for subminimum wage. After several agencies failed to find me employment, I was offered services at Partnership Resources Incorporated, um, and they found me a job in the community in 2011. I was employed in a big salon with over 40 stylists. <laughs> And someone who helped me, and as someone who helped in laundry with towels and other things needed to be washed, as well as janitorial work that needed to be completed, I was paid at least the minimum wage and appreciated that I got a real paycheck. I stayed there until 2016. Uh, since 2016, I've worked for Lunds and Byerly's groceries, taking them people's cars, helping collect carts, doing some cleaning work too. I have a checking job at Upstream Arts as a teaching artist, and I maintain a medical assistance through MAEBBT program. But uh, I don't work at Lunds and Byerly's anymore. I worked at the University of Institute on Community Integration. I believe that people with disabilities can work and should be offered to support work competitively. I was able to overcome the support not being offered to me because I believe in myself and I ask that you give other people the opportunity to find real jobs and not be stuck at some minimum wage. Thank you for your support to testify, chair and everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Up next is Matthew Bergeron, and on deck is Sue Hankner. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Matthew Bergeron with Larkin Hoffman. Here today on behalf of the Minnesota Alliance of Rural Addiction Treatment Programs, a statewide association of predominantly small rural SUD programs. Um, 
Uh, the president, Marty Paulson from Project Turnabout, sends her regret. She was hoping to be here, uh, but a scheduling conflict uh, got in the way. Uh, just wanted to speak very briefly um, to section 15 in the bill as it relates to the ASAM levels of care. Um, there's been some amendments uh, language adopted there. I know there's a, a number of uh, moving pieces in that space. Um, we've had the opportunity, Maritap has, to, to engage with the Department of Human Services in the last couple of days over that, that language. We've got some uh, questions and concerns as to the impact as to how uh, it would uh, impact reimbursement, particularly in the middle of a biennium. Um, and part of this just comes from the, the kind of tricky nature of the state moving from a, a historic uh, reimbursement and uh, regulatory model into one aligned with the ASAM criteria and the best practices there and doing so right at the time that ASAM comes out with the new edition. And so there's just a lot of moving pieces there. And so I think there were some uh, concerns uh, with the language as the bill was introduced, but those conversations are going well. So I just wanted to, to flag that for, for follow-up down the road, but appreciate the committee members' time. Thank you. Uh, up next is Sue Hankner. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for allowing 18 Minnesota to give testimony on House File 40, 4392. I am Sue Hankner, president of 18 Minnesota. We are a Minnesota community of people with significant intellectual or developmental disabilities, families and com community partners. We are a chapter within a national organization. We support a full array of work options from which to choose. We support informed choice. I am the mother of two sons with significant intellectual and developmental disabilities. In terms of their cognition, language, social and emotional development, they are like very young children. They are chronologically 45 and 50 years old. They are vulnerable adults. Both have been employed in 14C work options. 18 Minnesota opposes ending subminimum wage in center-based 14C work options. Requiring minimum wages for this community of people with significant IDD will not improve their quality of life. Those currently employed in the 14C work options already have their living expenses, readily available work supports, and reliable transportation paid for them. What they earn is spending money. Will the state fund the difference between what they are currently paid and the minimum wage? A financial and social impact of these provisions is unemployment for this community of workers. There is evidence and studies done by George Washington University, U.S. Government Accountability Office, and the U.S. Congressional Budget Office that shows that ending subminimum wage in states that have ended subminimum wage results in increased unemployment and increased movement to day activity programs. The unemployed with no available day activity program are isolated in their home. If improving the quality of life for this community of people with significant IDD is a goal, then a starting point is meeting them where they work. Ask them, how are you doing? What do you like? What don't you like? What do you want? And what can we do to help you? To this date, that has not been done. The subminimum wage task force sidelined these workers and excluded them and their families from membership on the task force. The lived experiences of current 14C workers and their families don't align and support how task force leadership wants the world to be. Please consider the lived experiences of this community of people with significant IDD and what they want for themselves. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. At this point in time, I would open it up to any other members of the public that would like to come and testify. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Mark proceed. Hughes and Chair uh, Fisher and everybody on this committee, thanks for your time. I'll be as brief as I can. While it's a tough call to eliminate the sub-minimum wage uh, that we're talking about today, we've seen great uh, people like LifeWorks that do support and employment for the disabled. Um, but I, I'm here to wonder when we go into a corporation and we're looking for jobs, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but it's perceived that the person comes in a scooter or a wheelchair, what can they do? I've had the good fortune of going to Carleton School of Management, graduating and going on to administrative position. Not everybody's had that, and I'm not bragging. And then I came here, and I'm not an administrator, but I try to do whatever it is I do. 
I uh, am in support of keeping the subminimum wage for the people that need it, the social programs, day programs for the people that need it. But here's an example. I served 12 years on the Minnesota State Council on Disabilities. At that time, we were invited over to 3M Corporation for a meeting. At that time, uh, the chairman from Walmart came to speak, and he said, I have my I Asperger's son driving him back and forth to the airport. I'm paying him for his employment, but I've also got people within the plant. I put a disabled person and an able-bodied person together, pay them the same wage and so forth. And I think you know what I'm saying, that even though somebody's able-bodied and I might be disabled, we can get it done just a different way. But to get, if we work together and get it done, we can pay it a more equal wage, but also take a good look at the subminimum wage program and keep it for those who need the day programs and who aren't as fortunate as I. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I hope you don't take that in the wrong context, what I was trying to say. Sounds good. Any other members? Or Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Jillian Nelson. I'm the Community Resource and Policy Advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. I'm an autistic adult. I also have the privilege of serving as a co-chair for the Minnesota Legislative Task Force on Eliminating Subminimum Wage. I want to offer just a couple clarifying points. As someone who was at the helm in creating that plan um, and countering some other community comments we heard, this plan, the ending of subminimum wage, is completely separate from any need to change anything about the day programs, the work environment, the job type, the job structure that people with disabilities are currently working. We have zero opposition to someone who wants to work in a sheltered environment in our day program for two to three hours a week putting widgets into a plastic bag. We have zero opposition to that. What we oppose is paying people with disabilities below minimum wage. There has been proof, there have been providers that have transitioned out of Section 14C while maintaining their sheltered employment programs, including one that did it with MTI in rural Minnesota that maintained all 30 employees that they had pay, being paid subminimum wage are now still in the same employment structure making minimum wage or higher. This is not about changing environments. This is not about taking away choices of where to work or how to work. This is about human dignity and that minimum means minimum and people with disabilities deserve to be treated the same as every other Minnesotan. I would also like to counter this idea that people who are in these programs who are on waivers have all of their living expenses paid for. I am engaged in customized employment. My job was developed for me based on my very specific disability needs and the type of support I need. I am on a caddy waiver like most of the people who are in these programs and I guarantee you my waiver does not pay for 100% of my living expenses. My waiver pays for my disability support needs. Things like shampoo are not a disability support needs. Things like social recreation options are not considered a disability support need. Things like shoes, clothing, fuel for a vehicle, a bus pass, a hairbrush, a new comforter, a pots and pans, an energy drink, a Coke when I'm on my way between meetings, going out to coffee with friends, none of those things are paid for by disability services or group homes. So we are asking people with disabilities to receive paychecks as low as $1.60 for two weeks of work with the expectation of, oh, they don't need money, disability services covers everything. You are the people that pass disability service provisions. You know that waivers do not cover any of those things. And we are seeing that people with disabilities deserve to be paid less than everyone else, that we are valued less than everyone else, and that we don't deserve the opportunity to pick out what brand of shampoo we use, what brand of shoes we wear, what our clothing looks like. There's a recent video that just came out, and it came out after a very rough hearing on the same issue last week. And it, it was put out in, for Down Syndrome World Day, and I, the, that video link is included in your packets. But it's, it's all about this concept that if you assume that I can't, I won't. That we're creating that reality, but if we assume they can, maybe they will. And that video was created and written 
by performers and artists with Down syndrome. The same people that organizations like the A-Team will tell you can't do it. If we tell them they can't do it, if we send that as the reality, they will not. If we give them a chance to say you are worth the same as every other Minnesotan, then maybe they will surprise us. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. And I did have a chance to see the video and it is very well done. Uh, any other members of the public? Please make your way down. Please state your name for the record. Good Proceed. afternoon. My name is Kurt Rutson. I wasn't going to testify today, but I um, heard all these fine people, and I just couldn't sit still. Um, to me, to me, um, I look at it as you guys are sitting here. I appreciate all of you. Um, I want to see the 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 wage a lot a lot higher. Um, I work in the mornings as a school bus aide for Schmidt and Sons, and they love me and they pay me well. And um, don't tell them I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they pay me very well. And um, and the supervisor of that company don't understand why they can't pay everyone like this. To me, it's like you guys all go out to eat right, and and you then leave you leave your napkins on the table, maybe spill something here and there, and you know, your kids like them messy. To me, you guys are saying, this is for the disability person. That's all he or she deserves. I have, uh, uh, and I can print off more, I just ran out. But a meeting that says we pay some of our disability people <coughs> seven cents an hour. And that is unheard of. And I just, I just, like one guy, a few of my buddies, I say, Maybe that's all I'm worth. Mm. Is that all I'm worth? Then at least tell us, you know, that is all you're worth. Be honest with us. Because I'm feeling kind of sometimes like that's all I'm worth. And that's not okay. But, but my friend always says, could, that's just the way it is. So I appreciate your time and um, contact me anytime. I think somebody told me this is my 28th year here. And um, yeah, wow. <laughs> so I appreciate all of you. And please, you guys, if we're not worth that, tell us. Stop it in the hall and say, you're not worth that. Okay, let's go have lunch. So thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. At this point, we'll turn it over to member questions. Up first, we've got Representative Curran. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Chair Fisher, uh, for uh, presenting this bill today and to our testifiers, I really appreciate the heartfelt comments that we've heard today. Um, and without repeating what others have said, I just, I want to be very clear um, on what the intent is with this as well. Um, as many folks know, this was my background, uh, the majority of my background coming, uh, prior to coming to legislature. 
was working 20 years in the disability services field. Um, and this is an issue that I, I think I think about it a lot. I think I've thought about it long and hard. Um, and you know, eliminating subminimum wage is not eliminating choice. It's being branded that way, unfortunately. Um, and I, you know, I've heard uh, comments about uh, folks get state funds, waiver funds, other funds to pay for their needs in life. And I'm just trying to ha wrap my head around how on earth my employer has any business knowing how I pay for the rest of the stuff in my own life. How would anybody else get away with that? Um, how do I pay for my shampoo? How do I pay for my medications? Is nobody else's business and you don't get to pay me less or more because of how I pay for those expenses. So I just wanna make that very clear that that on, in its, on its face is a discriminatory way of thinking about it. Um, and I know those are harsh words, but that's the truth. That is the, the core of what we're talking about here. Um, and again, it's not about eliminating choice. This is about eliminating a loophole whereby cheap labor can be performed under the guise of opportunity. We've come to a place where many are convinced that we are doing the disability community a favor by providing jobs that are paying as low as seven cents an hour, piecework. And you know, I, I hear worry, I hear questions like, what else are people gonna do? Um, perhaps people might uh, entertain the idea of treating people equitably and with dignity and paying folks a wage that they deserve when they're working. Um, you know, we might consider shifting expenses that we're using uh, in some organizations. Um, you know, looking at public records, over the course of four years, an organization might spend two and a half million dollars on lobbying expenditures, for example, that could be used toward better wages for people with disabilities. So I wanna just highlight, you know, where some priorities are. I understand there's worry about change but we, have year, we are years beyond the point where we've decided that able-bodied folks know what's best for someone with a disability. And this is another area that we need to catch up in, um, where we again have folks saying, I, you know, I think I know what's best for someone. Um, and I just, I really have a difficult time with that, especially when we have people from the disability community themselves coming here and saying this change is needed. Um, so I just, I really wanted to highlight that um, and uh, thank you for bringing this forward. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hicks. Thank you so much, Chair and Chair Fisher, for bringing this bill. Um, I want to just take an opportunity to remind this committee that I've had lots of MAPD improvements in front of you this year, as I did last year. MAPD is Medical Assistance for Employed Persons with Disabilities, people making money. There is a lot of misconception in Minnesota and across the nation about work incentives and what happens if people work and earn too much. And in a prior life, I may have been a work incentives uh, coordinator and helped people figure that out. So I did some math in preparation for today. So if someone is currently on Social Security or SSI and not working at all, they are getting $943 a month. They start working. SSI gives $2 for every, for every $2 they earn, their SSI goes down by $1. There are some income disregards and some special programs, and if anybody wants to get into those level of detail, you let me know. <coughs> but, if someone was working and earning minimum wage for 20 hours a week, just 20 hours at 1085, they would start earning $868 a month. If we use the $20 income disregard and then we divide by two for the work incentive component that is SSI, someone would, their SSI would go down from $948 a month to $519 a month but they would have earned 868. 
So prior to beginning to work at minimum wage for 20 hours a week, their, their income every month was $943. They start working at 20 hours a week for $10.85. Their new monthly income is $1,387. That is an increase in their income of 47%. 47%. Giving them the opportunity to do things that were never on the table before. Giving them the opportunity to explore other opportunities, such as maybe not living in a group home, maybe living in an apartment with staffing. So when we talk about everything is covered, or it makes no meaningful impact, I would challenge you, what would 47% more income mean to you? Is it really not meaningful? I am so grateful, Chair Fisher, for you bringing this conversation back to the table again this year. I'm glad we get to have it again. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and again, this is a, a very challenging discussion. Overall, though, Chairman Fisher, I do like the bill. I mean, I think they're doing a lot, a lot of good things for DHS and the policy. We've got to get our, our ASAM uh, adjustments right during this transition. We've got to give DHS the ability to do that. Uh, substance use um, folks that are working in this field have got to get these things corrected and right. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time on 14C and, and for obvious reasons. I, uh, you know, that still for me, is a challenging conversation to have because of the family members that are begging us not to change it for fear of they don't know for sure. Your arguments are right. There, there's nothing wrong with the arguments of saying you want to force them because it will force something. I don't know what that, that forcing will actually do just yet. I, I don't know that. I sat on um, uh, a, a job provider back in Wilmer for eight years as a board member. We had extremely happy employees that were both employed in the community, paid minimum wage and paid subminimum wage. They were all loved on and taken care of. And I just, I wanna make sure that we aren't looking at this as if this is going to somehow either stay or go away. It's gonna, it's going to make the employers not do as much as they can for these employees that are doing this work. Um, my question is, and this came up last year too, and I know we didn't have the, as long of a testifying group because we had a lot of passion last year. We had a lot of, lot of heartburn and a lot of concerns either way, both ways. And again, um, you know, Dupree did a great job today talking about his exit out of the program and, and Kurt did a nice job today too. My concern is that, um, what, my, here's my, my question maybe to, me, to you, Mr. Chair, is the current folks that are on under the 14C chapter now, Last year, I think it was around 5,500 people. We saw this thing ramping down naturally. Where is it a year later, Chair Fisher, if you could share that with us, just to see what's happening naturally for those employers and those folks that are using this choice. Where's it at today? Chair Fisher. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair <clears throat> Frederick uh, and Representative Baker. I don't have actual numbers. What I can tell you is that I know that one of the providers in my district that was using 14C before has transitioned off. And one of the things they've experienced in that process is they now have families bringing folks to them that were on programs that were on 14C and finding that their kids are doing much better, uh, just as happy, and earning more than they were before. So I can't give you overall numbers. I can talk to what I've seen with providers in my district. And while originally when this discussion was started years ago, I had reservations. And as I've watched this program roll out and the uh, thought that's been put into it, the supports that are out there, and hearing how, going back to what Kurt said, you know, you know, only getting paid seven cents an hour, what that says to a person is, is, is very dehumanizing. And when I take a look at to how the programs have moved it forward that are doing this and doing it so successfully, and as I've watched even the piecemeal work, it reminded me in the private sector, when I worked in the private sector, we had some people who performed very well, we had some people that performed the less, and they kind of balanced each other out, and that's what made it work. And that's what I'm seeing happening in this program here, very much what happens in your regular workplace. So I think it's something that's very important. <clears throat> 
I think we have somebody here who might be able to give a little bit uh, more information on the numbers. Director Grom. Um, Mr. Chair, Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services, Representative Baker, thank you for the question. I think there's around 3,000 or so people now. We've seen a significant decrease in the number of providers and number of people offering um, wages below the minimum wage. I will say that um, one of the reasons that that probably is is because we put in, this legislature has put in place so many policies um, to help encourage that shift. And I think a lot of what happened last session was part of that, but we've had policies across the years that are really um, trending the community in this direction. And so to continue to set those benchmarks, like setting you know, a phase out date of 2028, for example, we'll continue to move the needle. So hopefully by the time we get there, there isn't an issue. People have transitioned and the, and the community is feeling comfortable with the reform. Representative Baker. Mr. Chair, I think again, I, I, it's, Again, it's roughly half of what it was a year ago. It is going in the direction that these providers are seeing, and, and they see us talking about this, and our families are realizing this. Again, it's not that uh, we don't see that, that direction. I'm, I, if there's 3,000 and something passes and it happens fairly quickly, I would be devastated if we had 500 people all of a sudden not have a place to go to work. That would be devastating to me. Not saying we don't know that's going to happen. We aren't sure about that. I just know that there could be some unintended, unintended consequences if we all of a sudden keep packaging everything in a one-size-fits-all. Every worker in those situations have very unique skill levels and very unique issues, and we want to be supportive of whatever those are. So, again, um, uh, we, uh, this has other stops, so we'll, we'll, we'll stop. I know we're towards the end here, Mr. Chair, but I just want to say that it's still an issue, and I, I think there's still, I hear a lot of passion still on the other side of this issue as well. So I want to make sure we keep talking about this in the process it is. So thank you for that. All right, thank you. I have uh, just want to be cognizant of the time, so I'm going to ask for the two people that we got left to be brief, please. Representative Edelson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank Representative Hansen uh, for her work last year on this. Uh, Representative Fisher, thank you. Director Grum, I know you've worked on this for, for years. Um, I guess my only quick feedback is, um, Supportive, and I think that in line 3.126, I think really uh, 3126, I think we should add a report to the legislature in 25, 26, 27 on the phase out so that we can have numbers. I think actually, Representative Baker, what you're asking is a good question. My mind is going there too. See, we think alike. Um, I want to know. I want to know um, while you're doing the phase out, where what the status is um, of the phase out, and so just so that we understand the challenges that the legislature can address as we phase out. Thank you, uh, Director Graham. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Edelson, I think that's a great idea. Last year, the legislature did pass in, um, pass a provision that required the collection of data from providers and also alignment across the Minnesota Department of Education, DHS, DEED. Um, so providers are aware of these data collection requirements um, as of last July, I believe. So we'll be gathering that as a department and we can look at when would be the right time to provide a report and provide those updates throughout the years. Sounds good. Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I hear the passion. Uh, at last year when we heard this, the calls I received was not that the individuals were not making enough money, that the individuals valued the work that they did. And when we talk about work, it's more than that dollar and cents. It's talk about the effort and the knowing that they accomplished something. And that is my biggest concern, is that disability, as we are all familiar, has a wide spectrum. One disability is different than a, a, another disability. And I'm concerned that we could eliminate some of those individuals with this here. And that's my concern, because work is more than that final paycheck. It's also the value of, of accomplishing something. And um, that is what I heard last year when we had those, that one long night afterwards for many constituents. So that's it. Thank you. I do appreciate your work. You're doing a great job. Um, I know your heart's in the right place. I do that. Chair Fisher, thank you. Chair Fisher, closing comments and renew your motion. Uh, I want to say thank you for everyone for the robust, uh, robust discussion on this, and thank you particularly to Chair Hansen who did a lot of work, or excuse me, to Representative Hansen who did a lot of work on this <laughs> issue last year. Um, I would ask for your support. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Fisher. Your bill is laid over.
Our next hearing will be tomorrow, Tuesday, March 19th. We will have eight bills from a variety of authors. We are adjourned.